Hey, Scott from MyGrowthRings.com here, and welcome back once again for a midweek episode of a little show we like to call Stumped Q&A. The purpose behind this is uh, to answer your questions, comments, and cheap shots from the video that I posted uh, earlier in the week. Now, it turns out this week I posted two videos. I was an overachiever, so we got several questions to answer. On that point, uh, please notice that in the description below, uh, you can find the links to the various points in the timeline where I'm answering different questions. And depending upon the device you're using, those questions might even show up in the timeline. I'm still dealing with flies here. They're driving me nuts. Um, what can I do? Uh, also, I wanna welcome new subscribers. We've had 219 new subscribers in the last month. So uh, thank you and welcome. So let's see, uh, the two videos I posted, one was on the uh, the Bittner nut, which is this quarter 20 nut driven into a half inch nut that's used for jigs and fixtures. Um, and we also had a video response to Stumpy Nubs video on using saw guards. So uh, a mix of questions. I also forgot to mention a couple things. So let me go back and, and answer my own questions. Uh, the first one is, okay, which way do you face the nylon lock nut? Um, it, it's not that way. When you press these in, the easy way appears to be to put the, the nylon portion into the nut as you press it in. And it is easier, but that's not the way you want it because you're going to be putting the cap screw, in the case of this uh, Bittner knob, where we're locking a cap screw into that lock nut, um, we want the, the nylon portion to be near the outside. So that means we drive the other end in. Okay, um, also I wanted to point out to you that depending upon the length of cap screw or really any machine screw or bolt you buy, they may be, as they are here, fully threaded, threaded all the way up to the head or you might wind up with one that's partially threaded. So what's interesting here is this is an inch and a quarter, this is an inch and a half, and yet they have almost the same threaded section. Okay, so this does me no good. I gained no additional length with that cap screw. So keep an eye out for that if you need to use a longer screw. Um, and the thing I failed to mention, but put in the title or subtitle on the screen, or what do you call that? caption is that the best thing about this is it's adjustable in length by adjusting the cap screw in and out we can adjust how far that sticks out of the knob that's uh, that's great for things like i mentioned using here on my t-nuts these are shopsmith t-nuts not hardware store t-nuts um, if those were sticking out i would have wanted to back them out a little bit and so um, I would have used a longer length bolt and just backed it out. So uh, that, let's see, brings to mind another comment here. Several people, in fact, commented how they thought it was an interesting idea, but due to arthritis or due to other uh, issues with their grip, that they would prefer something larger. So, for example, on this fixture right here, um, I, I made these handles that have standard hardware store T-nuts on them, and uh, those work great. And if, if I needed to get more tension or torque on them, I could have made little notches on these as well. I demonstrate how this thing works, but I don't have a cat handy. So maybe some other episode will do that. Um, let's see, what else did I want to tell you? Oh, yeah. If you don't have a strong vice or access to a strong vice, Another tip is you can use half inch nylon stop nuts and you can press the quarter 20 nut into that. So you are just pressing it into the nylon washer there, but for, for hand tightening and adding you know accessory fences and things like that, that does work fine. And I, and I actually did that for a couple of years because I didn't have access to a decent vise. And uh, just so happens on this Harbor Freight nylon lock nut assortment that I bought. Um, it comes with 10 of the, the half inch lock nuts. And then it has uh, 35 of the quarter 20. There's 25 quarter 28 or fine thread. So um, that's a great assortment. 
I think it's like seven bucks. And then of course you can use a 20% off coupon anytime at Harbor Freight. All right, uh, more questions, comments. Uh, Beth Perkins asked, can we see some jigs and fixtures that incorporate the use of the bitten or nut knob? Yes, you will. Um, I, I mentioned in a previous video that I'm starting to set some equipment up here at my home. I have a shop, it's 18 miles away from my home and it's just not convenient. And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna replicate the most used jigs and fixtures right here in my, my home shop. Um, I've got to build some furniture for this space, you know, some some storage and things. And so we're going to do that together. I'm going to share it right here. So, yeah, there will be jigs and fixtures coming and they will incorporate that. Um, Rhino Horn commented on on bolt grades and, and, and wasn't aware of how many grades there are. You know, I only talked about grade two, uh, grade six and grade eight. There's actually even more if you get into the metric metric system. There's other ways of grading. There's like a grade A and a grade B. So there's a wide range. I'll put a link uh, to a, a neat little cheat sheet that you can uh, check out. Bolts are graded and nuts are graded. And so if, if you have no head markings at all, it's a grade two, it's a soft bolt. When you look at uh, standard USS bolts, you always add two to the number of little markings that are on the head. I'm not talking about markings like you know, the, the, the hallmark from the manufacturer. Um, let me see. Here's, all right, here's, here's a bolt that has all kinds of markings on it, but I'm talking about the lines and there are no lines on this one. So this is a grade two. Um, you add two to the number of little lines that are on there. So if it had three, you add two, it's a grade five. If it has six markings, you add two, it's a grade eight. All right. So yeah, and the nuts themselves should also be marked. And if they aren't marked, we assume they're grade two. Um, R.D. Helm said that he's looking for a budget T-nut. Yeah, these T-nuts from Shopsmith, if you happen to have a Mark V, they're wonderful. We use them on our fence. We use them on the bandsaw fence. We use them on the table system to lock things down. And I think they're like five bucks each now from Shopsmith. Uh, I don't know of an alternative off the shelf, but we're going to come up with something and I'll share it on the channel. Um, so good, good question. Um, Hal Mann was concerned about magnets. This actually goes back to the Shopsmith toolbox. That's the 532nd hex wrench that um, I suggest storing it on the end of the machine where it was designed to be stored. But um, uh, both Hal and, let me see, um, uh, Albert commented about how, in, in Albert's case, he's got a, a machine called a Mark 7. There was a Mark 7 made in the 1960s, and there's now a Mark 7, and that machine tilts not only up into the drill press position, but it tilts the opposite direction with the headstock under the table for operations like shaping and routing. And as a result, those locations where I store my hex wrench and my my, uh, my chuck key, they don't exist on a Mark 7. So I would use magnets. But as, um, as Hal points out, he's concerned about putting a magnet near his headstock, which happens to be the uh, electronic variable speed power pro. And I think that's, that's well-founded concern. So if you're going to put a magnet on it, and I wouldn't be as scared to, but I would I would put it over on the belt cover and I would epoxy it so it can't possibly drift anywhere near the electronic control. If you don't want to do that, um, you can uh, stick a magnet down on the left hand leg. Uh, that seems to be a very convenient place for me anyway. Uh, that puts it then near if you're running a joint or a bandsaw any accessory, it keeps it near that end. Um, or you can put it on an accessory table if you have one of those on your machine which brings up a comment from Chad. What do you think about that accessory table, uh, accessory shelf? I wouldn't be without it. Uh, even back when I was the academy instructor in Dayton, we had a four by four pegboard at every workstation by every Shopsmith Mark V for the students. But, but my unit up front that I demoed always had that accessory shelf. This Mark Seven, I'm sorry, this Mark V came with a home built accessory shelf, which is horrible. So I will be replacing it. So maybe I'll make one, maybe I'll buy one. If I make one, we'll talk about it right here. 
But uh, Chad, yes, I do like the accessory shelf. Let's see, uh, Jim asked about making, oh, actually he commented after the safety video about making some modifications to his homemade zero clearance inserts. This is a ShopSmith made zero clearance insert plastic. Um, and you'll notice that this one has a wide slot here in the back that's designed to accommodate the splitter and the anti-kickback device on the uh, ShopSmith model uh, Mark 5, 510 and the 520 and the Mark 7. Um, but if you make one of these at home and you use masonite or plastic or something, you may not have gone through the trouble of, of widening the groove or the slot. Do it. It's worth it. You can then put your splitter in and have your, your anti-kickback device work. Uh, it's, worth, it's worth the effort. Um, oh, but to Jim. Jim is an active uh, woodworker here on YouTube, and he uses ShopSmith equipment, but not just that. He has the most watched ShopSmith video on YouTube with 600 and 21,000 views. So I'm gonna to link to his channel. You need to go check that out. Uh, let's see, both John and Mike asked about the Mark V model 500 guards. Are there guards available for that? Yeah, unfortunately they're not very good. Um, the the mod model 500 was the machine that was introduced back in 1954, 55, and was in production till about the mid 90s. And, um, and in fact, when they introduced the Mark, the ShopSmith Mark V model 510 in the mid eighties, they continued for about 10 years to make both models. And uh, when they designed the Mark V model 510, they started with the guards and, and they designed it. Could we make a guard that'll hold a 12 inch sanding disc? Can we make a guard that'll work well with a dust collector and a vacuum? We want a guard that allows us to put a riving knife, not just a splitter. And once they had that guard designed and patented, by the way, they then built a table system around it that required a number of changes. The Mark V Model 500 just was never made to have guards. And so the guards might keep you safe, but they, they also fall into that category that maybe they don't. Um, if you do want to find a guard, at least for dust collection purposes, you can find them on eBay. They're no longer manufactured. Um, but look for one that has the large port, the shop vac size or shopsmith dust collector size. I think it's like two and a quarter inch port. There are some that are two, uh, one inch and one and a quarter. Those do not work very well. So just avoid those. Uh, Mark said, he pointed out, I forgot to tighten the set screw in the uh, safety video on the, uh, the, the saw arbor. Yeah, on one of the one of the demonstrations, there were too many, by the way. I did forget to tighten the set screw. We'll do a video sometime and show you what happens if you forget and forget to tighten the set screw. It's no big deal, actually, on the saw. Um, and then let's see, Keith asked about the upper saw guard when the table is tilted. Yeah, when you tilt the table, the upper saw guard due to gravity wants to slide over against the blade. So let me direct you to a video I did a couple years ago where I built a, um, a little three-legged candle stand uh, out of a eight-foot length of two by four. And in that video, you'll see where I've got the table tilted and you'll notice that I set the saw guard up on the board, just the tip of it, before I start the saw. And that way, the, the guard is held in place. I can make the cut, and the, the guard doesn't slide into the blade. However, I'll show you. My saw guard has been in the blade in that exact operation. So, yeah, it's one of those things that we'll, uh, we'll go into detail on a future video. It's, uh, it's worth, worth learning how to do that properly. And then um, Chad also timed the conversion from drill press to table saw. Thank you, Chad, for doing that. Like I said, uh, I, I don't care how long it takes. If it takes longer, I consider that quality time spent with my tools. So, all right, so that, that's pretty much it for this one. I appreciate all of your, uh, your, your comments. I mean, to me, this is what makes this fun and interactive, the social part of the social media. So thanks for joining me in the videos and uh, look forward to seeing you again this weekend for something interesting. All right. Make it a great week.